All right, this is the Angular session. Not to be confused with Angular, so if you're here for any discussions about phishing, we're sorry, that's a little bit further down the road. Uh, I'm Andy, I'm with the developer outreach team. My focus is mostly on the web, web mobile, and native Android. This is right up my alley. My coworker Jacob here. Hey everybody, um, I'm in professional services uh, and I am really excited to get you excited about Angular in Dojo. <laughs> um, so I guess we can just jump right into it, right? Yeah, let's sure. jump into it. Okay. So uh, we feel like it's important to have a little bit of a table of contents kind of section so uh, to help you follow along with the journey we're going to take you on. Um, so if, you know, if anyone's involved in Angular, you'll know that that's sort of a big loaded word and that could include Angular 1, that could include... I'll move the mic up just a little bit. Oh, thank you. That could include Angular 2 and that's going to become Angular 3 or 4 or something like that if anyone's paying attention uh, to what's going on over there. So uh, first we're going to stick with Angular 1 and show you what we already have available uh, for those of you who want to use the Esri JavaScript API, um, there's a big old library of stuff that'll make your life a lot easier. Um, and then we're going to spend a, a bit of time focusing and switching gears to Angular 2. And within that, we'll follow two major patterns that we call the dedicated module loader pattern and the exclude and require pattern that will make it possible um, and a lot easier for you if you're making Angular 2 apps and you want to use the Esri JavaScript API. Uh, later on, we'll round it out with some uh, Ionic and uh, mobile discussions. Uh, and the reason I'm throwing in this, these uh, icons here uh, is just to help us all follow along that if you see red, we're talking about Angular JS version one. And if we see uh, the white Angular logo, uh, we'll be talking about Angular 2. And please note that Angular does not have the word Angular JS. It's very specific. <laughs> There's a whole press kit website for this that explains it at the uh, Angular uh, websites. So how many people in here are already doing Angular 1? Nice. And how many people are doing Angular 2? How many people are doing both at the same time? Oh, quite a few. <laughs> Well, one of the key things that we found from talking to people is the difference between single page web applications and coming into building modern JavaScript. Of going from an application where all you need to do is build plain old JavaScript and throw in some HTML and that thing runs just fine into the world of Angular where we start talking about module loaders and we start talking about transpilers and we start talking about TypeScript and how that relates to everything. So everything we're about to show you here is what we refer to as modern JavaScript. The other point we want to make is, I apologize for the feedback. The other point we want to make is there's many different ways to go about doing what we're going to show you. We're not going to be recommending best practices per se, since there's so many ways to come at some of these different problems, there's so many different ways to build uh, on Angular with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. What we have for you today is just some examples of some patterns that we've learned from working on applications ourselves, as well as feedback from people like you and the community. And we hope to bring those home in the next 50 minutes or so. Yeah, so. We know you're using Angular 1, Angular 2, and these days you've got a huge amount of other choices you could make. Um, so honestly, some of the stuff we'll talk about uh, will apply to other frameworks too. So that's sort of the added bonus of some of the things we'll, we'll cover. Um, are some there, of the stuff's gonna repeat itself too, just a little bit. There's a little bit of overlap. Yeah. Like Ionic uses, the latest version of Ionic uses Angular 2, so there's going to be some overlap there, but right, these patterns may not be exactly like what you would use in something like Ember or Vue, 
but hopefully we're giving you enough information to at least point you in the right direction. And even if you're not using the patterns that we're going to show you here in our demonstrations, that some of the resources that are available in those repos will hopefully get you going in the right direction because, like we said, there's many different ways to go about solving some of these issues. Maybe we can do one more quick poll. Uh, are, is there anyone here who is not using Angular or hasn't? Uh, likes other frameworks? Okay. Good number. Yeah, so that's good. Okay, so yeah, hopefully this will apply to you if you're going to get into Angular 1 or Angular 2 or you're already using other frameworks. Hopefully there's something here for everybody. But uh, the overall story will still be in, through the lens of Angular 1 and Angular 2. So uh, I'm again wanting to drive home the point of these, uh, these red icons just to make it clear. Again, we're talking about Angular 1 right now during this, during, during this uh, chapter. Um, and we've, at Esri, we've been able to use Angular 1 and the JavaScript API, which you know is actually using Dojo. Um, we've been able to use it, we use it in production applications, and we have several years under our belts of sort of having some really good uh, practices and advice uh, to, to share with you. Um, so I think something that's sort of uh, elemental, but it's important to bring up and point out is that uh, we found that you may not have the best luck if you're making a Dojo application and you're trying to put Angular 1 inside of it. Um, so we found that it's a bit better for you if you're willing to go ahead and commit fully to AngularJS 1 and then use the Esri JavaScript API inside of that as necessary. Um, and I'll, these slides are actually borrowed from uh, one of our last year presentations on this, but the more I look at this, the more I feel bad for myself and everyone else in here because of these uh, Reese's peanut butter cups are horribly uh, distracting. But I'm gonna move on, so I'm just gonna point that out and then I'm gonna move on so everyone can think about Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> so we do have a, um, a, a pretty sizable uh, uh, and, and a popular repo called the Angular Esri Map. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that up and show you what we have. So again, this is Angular 1, and it's to make your life a lot easier if you want to use the JavaScript API. Um, so I'm not gonna scan through the readme just right now. I'll go ahead and open up our demonstration website to show you what this does. So this provides a module for Angular JS 1, and it supports the JS API 3, supports JS API 4, uh, but some of these examples I'll show you right now are, are are demonstrating JS API 4. Uh, what we give you is an Esri scene view directive and an Esri map view directive. And that's sort of your entry point into bringing in the JavaScript API. I'm gonna show you a sample really quickly to show you this works. And our demonstration website uh, that's uh, out on GitHub actually is a large, in of itself, a large Angular JS, I think at the moment 1.6 app with routes and all kinds of good stuff in there. So you can look at the source code for this demo site as a big help. But we have, um, what we've done is try to uh, represent and replicate the... Oh, is it too soft? Is that better? No. Is that better? People in the back? Okay, I can, I'll just try to speak up a bit. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that, thank you. So we've tried to recreate the JavaScript, Esri JavaScript API official sample docs as closely as possible so you can follow along with how it would work here. So I'll just scroll down a little bit to show you the, the standard feature layer example that Esri has. And the HTML is more or less this Esri map view directive that comes with this repository. Um, if you want a 2D view. Um, if you're familiar with the 4.x JavaScript API, you know that there's also a scene view. So that's what the Esri scene view directive would be for if you want to do 3D visualizations. Uh, what's interesting is that your directive's properties uh, required one as a map. Uh, because in, at the, in the 4x API, uh, the map is more of like, almost like a data model. So that's actually a property that goes into this directive. And then any other view options that are documented in the JS API docs uh, are supported here. If I switch over to the JS that runs this, uh, what you see is this module that we provide in this repository also provides uh, an Esri loader uh, utility inside that will actually load in 
the Esri JSA API modules. So once you get inside of here, you're actually, this code should look quite familiar and it will be JSA API dojo style coding. So let's jump back out. Now that I've made a plug for that repository, I highly encourage uh, you to go there when you have a chance. And we have a lot of other documentation, including long form discussions on patterns and best practices, um, plenty of other uh, examples. Uh, but to walk you through a few of the nuts and bolts, uh, we're going to really quickly recreate what you see in the screenshot here. Um, and this code actually comes directly from the readme for this repository. So I, you are going to watch me copy and paste this as painful as that might be, hopefully it won't last too long. And I'm gonna just take it right over to JS bin and uh, run this live. Pasting that in directly from uh, my slides, but again, this is in the readme and I'll go ahead and run this code. And so I'll just step through a few key lines here to show you how this is working. So again, what we've done here is we've really quickly made an Angular 1 app. And we've pulled in, in the, in the head of HTML, we've pulled in this, the Esri JS API CSS. And in the body, we've defined the ng controller. And here's that Esri scene view. Uh, again, you, we provide the Esri scene view or the Esri map view as directives if you're using AngularJS one. Uh, also what's important is that we have three script tags here. And that's the Esri JS API, just like you'd pull it in any other any other way in your apps. We are also loading an Angular JS because of course this is an Angular one application. And we're pulling in on line 34 the actual uh, this this actual library uh, at version two. And and that's that's um, those are details you can you can check out in the README, but uh, our version two just means it supports JS API four. Um, and unpackage if you're not familiar with that is actually uh, NPM, because we've published it to NPM as well. So what I want to point out uh, further down on line 40 is again this Esri loader and this require statement, which is just really sort of wrapping the dojo require, but it's just been uh, uh, enhanced a bit to stay within the Angular scope. Um, so that's why uh, you're able to still uh, keep in touch with the rest of your view model. Uh, you haven't sort of lost that context. Uh, because uh, you know, this asynchronous nature you know, and dojo module loading can sort of get you out of the AngularJS scope cycle. So that's, that's what that's taking care of for you. But, other, but again, line 40 and down, it just should be fairly familiar from the JS API documents as to what this is doing. Uh, and we also just wanted to point out a few of, uh, more resources from last year. Um, we, uh, there was a couple talks regarding Angular. Uh, so links are here, including a video from last year. So you can check those out when you have a chance. And there's a lot of great resources there. So uh, that's uh, in an effort to not spend too much time in Angular JS 1 during this presentation. So we want to talk about the latest and greatest with Angular 2. All right, so again, you're seeing my white icon. I'm just trying to drive it home that we're switching gears to Angular version 2 and above. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, while we get into Angular 2, we're going to first talk about this, uh, this pattern called the dedicated module loader. And in Angular 2, uh, as Andy was mentioned earlier, uh, the world becomes a lot bigger with what you can do and the options that are available to you. So um, if you keep in mind this, this idea of a dedicated module loader, and if you want to use Angular 2 and above with Webpack, then what you could do is use the Angular 2 as reloader. And that is a utility um, that will try to uh, inject the JavaScript API as a script tag uh, on the fly as needed um, into your Angular 2 app. So let's just look at that really quickly. And that's, this source code is just showing you that it's actually creating a script tag. It's, uh, it's, it's wrapping around the Dojo require, and that is sort of the underlying magic of how that gets in there is made available. You have to blow up the text there. Can you guys in the back see that text? Is it too small? Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So let's get back. So the Angular 2 is your loader, and I'll show you that as well. Um, yeah, it looks like that text is big enough. 
So if you are building an Angular 2 app and you have uh, the desire to bring in the Esri JavaScript API, uh, this Angular 2 service that we provide, uh, actually uh, under Tom Wason's um, GitHub username, uh, Tom's out here somewhere, I think I saw him walk in, what this will do is uh, give you a really nice clean pattern if you need to bring in uh, the JS API into one of your uh, components in Angular 2. So you'd import it. Uh, once you have it plugged into your library, you would import it um, on this line right here. And sort of in a similar pattern from what you saw with the Angular 1 support that we provide, once it's in here, you'll be loading specific modules. In this case, this is a quick example using the JS API 3 inside of your Angular 2 app. And we're just loading, uh, again, as a thin wrapper around the Dojo require, we're loading in the Esri map module and then creating it and then putting it in the DOM as necessary, again, within this Angular 2 component. Uh, and this graphic uh, comes directly from Tom Wason's blog. Uh, we've got links, several links pointing back to this blog post uh, throughout this, throughout this uh, discussion. Um, it's, uh, what this is just trying to show is that in, the, in this pattern of the dedicated module loader, the, uh, the Esri loader um, repository that's sort of the underlying business logic and code uh, for the Angular 2 Esri loader I just, I just showed you, um, it sort of opens up the doors to let you actually bring in the JS API, the Esri JS API, to all kinds of different frameworks. Um, and it it's really opens up what you can do. Um, it's, and uh, I know this is an Angular talk, but this includes uh, the React kind of path you can take too if you want to try these things out. Um, and there's plenty of other examples. So right now, um, it may f hopefully it doesn't feel like we're jumping around too much, but what's important, and again, as Andy mentioned at the very beginning, is that there's a lot of options available to you and we're just trying to show you different avenues you could take. Um, and I will go ahead and show you this uh, GitHub just that we have. This is still a work in progress, but um, what this does is that if you're, if you, if for example, if you've heard of the Angular class, Angular 2 Webpack Starter repo. I'll actually increase that. Um, this is sort of a set of instructions of um, bare bone instructions of how to get started with the Angular 2 Esri loader utility that, that Tom Wason has provided and how you can wire that up in your own mapping components in Angular 2. Uh, so again, this link is available in the slides and you can uh, go through these steps when you have a chance. And the reason I've listed Angular Esri map uh, I, I promise I'm not trying to confuse you. The reason it's there, even though that's for Angular 1, is that um, this idea of this dedicated module loader that wraps the Dojo require uh, sort of came from this uh, tried and, tra uh, tried and uh, tested kind of in the, out there in the real world, this Angular Esri map repo has been doing this under the hood for quite some time. Um, so uh, we've been able to extract that out and uh, make it a little bit more generic for other frameworks, including Angular 2. Yeah, it's totally okay to borrow other people's works. Mm. And as also, I think you mentioned, uh, there are plenty of other contributions from the community related to Angular as well as React and other frameworks. And that's, that's what's really cool is we're getting feedback from people like you, and not just feedback directly on our repos, but you're also posting your own GitHub repos out there, like this K, the KGS916 one, for example. <laughs> that's from the community, that's from people like you guys, because we don't have all the answers. It, it really does come back to that, that theme that there's Hopefully you're getting a sense that there's many different ways to approach this and the, the, the funny thing is every time we think we have a right answer, we talk to one of you guys and you, and you say, well, I did it this way. And it works awesome for your requirements and usually under those circumstances we're gonna, we're gonna ask you, hey, why don't you post that out there on GitHub? It would be great for us to link to that and show that as an example. Yeah, that's a good point. We really wouldn't be where we are right now if it wasn't for the overall larger community. That's definitely been a, an effort, a shared effort to get to where we are. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty good uh, argument for uh, working together out on GitHub. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Uh, so again, within the context of Angular 
2 and this, this specific pattern we're talking about with the dedicated module loader, uh, there are some advantages. Um, what's one really cool thing is that if you have specific routes, maybe you have a larger app that has a lot of different routes, um, and maybe you don't even need to have, uh, maybe you don't have like a map-centric uh, use case or UI UX, maybe it's just a map or some uh, scene components show up every now and then. Um, you can, you know, you can actually relegate that just to one route or a specific route. So it's it's pretty nice. You don't have to load up the entire Esri JS API from the beginning and uh, let your Angular two app continue as is. Uh, so there are some, uh, I guess you could say, challenges. Uh, and as I've been trying to. Uh, mentioned a few times the global dojo require is there. It, we're trying to sort of uh, add, sort of push away from that or try to add a few layers where you don't necessarily notice that, but it is there. So it's it's floating around in the global space. It's still available. Um, so it, you know maybe you have uh, if you're on a larger team of a lot of Angular two uh, developers, uh, it just requires that. Everyone's a bit more familiar with what the Esri JavaScript API is doing because really, you know, you are mashing together two frameworks. You're just we're trying to make it clean for you to do that. On this last, but this last note here regarding uh, not being able to use ESX import statements, uh, I think that we're just getting at the fact that uh, you have to, you can use the import statement for the Esri loader service, but then later inside of your component, you're just going back to the sort of Dojo require style of bringing in AMD modules. Uh, so I sort of have a quick side note to make regarding System.js. Uh, are, are, is anyone out here uh, familiar with System.js? Okay, a few. Uh, the reason we wanted to throw this in here is because uh, about a year ago, we, we saw that Angular 2 in its beta form and release candidate form uh, seemed to be pushing for System.js. Since then, Webpack seems to have become super popular. So a lot of our focus is much more on Webpack. But uh, we do provide an, another library if you are already using System.js with your Angular 2 apps. Uh, and thanks go out to uh, Rene Rubiclava for this. Uh, I think he was sort of opened the doors from the very beginning on his, on his uh, blog post or, uh, from, yeah, about a year ago, right? About a year, year and a half ago. Yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah, um, and that's sort of what opened the doors to actually figure out how we can bring in the JS API into Angular 2. Um, and that's very very particular to System.js. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll just, yeah, I want to point out that you can use S3 System.js for that. And this is sort of what that looks like. And there's a, a, there's a bit more information in the readme on how that works. Uh, but instead of going through this, the same kind of, kind of uh, patterns and showing you the same thing over and over. I can just actually show you a quick visual of how that looks if you're using System.js. Uh, so this is just a demonstration application I've had out there for a while. Um, again, it's Angular 2, System.js, not to be confused with Webpack. And it's got a few routes of its own. Uh, it's got, you know, just show, showcasing some cool Esri technology, including the geometry engine and some reactive forms. Um, and so that's a totally different approach. So uh, you could take everything you see in this demo site and use it with Webpack. But again, the point is just to uh, show you that you have a lot of options available to you. So just as a quick summary, if you're using Angular 2, you can use Webpack. We've got some support for that. And you can use System.js as well, and we've got ways to help you with that. That looked right. Well, thanks, Jacob. So we showed you pattern one, which is, as Jacob showed you, it's using Esri Loader to essentially loop through all the different modules and load those directly into the page as a global require. So all the modules in the dedicated module loader are using, or share, essentially sharing a pattern that was developed for Angular 1, extending it for Angular 2, and injecting scripts directly into the page. And what we're gonna show you now is a different pattern 
and it's a different pattern. It may or may not be the right pattern for your requirements, but we're calling this the exclude and require pattern, and it's different than what Jacob just showed you. And I know that we're belaboring the point a bit, but these aren't the only patterns that are out there. Uh, the example usage that I'm going to be showing you, uh, we're continuing along the theme of Angular and Webpack. This is Angular 2 specifically. And the pattern that you use for Angular, or I'm sorry, for the exclude and require pattern, and I'll show you examples of this. You're going to configure the module loader inside of Webpack to exclude Dojo modules. Uh, we're also going to configure it to output AMD modules because Dojo is AMD, right? We're going to load the ArcGIS JavaScript API in a script tag just like normal. And there's no need. You'll see that there's no require statements anywhere in the TypeScript code that we're writing. And I'll show you an example of that. So let's take a look at configuring the module loader. So what I mean by this is in your webpack config, we're going to explicitly go into the externals property and essentially exclude all the Dojo modules. Now if you're using the CDN for our JavaScript API, you may notice that if this is missing that everything works okay. That's just a best practice to go ahead and put this in there. So it'll really come into play if you're loading our JavaScript API locally along with all the other modules that you may have. So just a little bit of a trick there. So this is inside Webpack config. This is exactly where we're at. Uh, the next thing we want to do, which is a key thing that you can't miss, again, we're in Webpack config, you absolutely want to make sure that the library target is set to AMD. Pretty tricky, but easy enough to do. Pretty straightforward, but if you forget to do it, things aren't going to work quite right. So the reason that we do all this is you're going to write your TypeScript. So you're going to write TypeScript that's going to look something like this. And this is just one example. This is a legacy reference here at the top of this example. If you're using the latest versions of TypeScript and Angular 2, you don't need this. For those of you that are using older versions of these things, you might recognize it. Uh, we're also using common JS imports. This is the same type of import statement that you would use with Node.js. So you, uh, for example, if we want to initialize a map, we're importing a map, and we use the pattern of require with a constructor of the module that you're familiar with from how you would normally build JavaScript applications, right? Uh, we're going to, we're also exporting the, this particular class which is called map controller. By exporting it, we're essentially telling the, the compiler to just return it. It's slate of hand because we're not using defaults here. And inside of this, uh, we have a start method and we're assigning some of the properties that you may already be familiar with such as setting the base map to topo, we can set the center. These are all part of the Esri map class. These are properties that are built in, right? Zoom level. And we initialize a new map as part of this class. So once, once we build this in TypeScript, the cool thing is, is it gets converted to JavaScript behind the scenes. So let's take a look at what this looks like in JavaScript. And notice when I said you don't have to explicitly include require like we did with the pattern that Jacob was showing you, is in this case we're creating a define, we're defining a module that has require in it and the transpiler converted our TypeScript to JavaScript. Pretty cool, right? It's just happening automagically. So 
what's happening is in our index.html file, so I just want to put this all together for you. I showed you that we're writing TypeScript. We're not using any explicit require statements. We're using common JS imports. The transpiler is converting all that to a defined module. What's happening behind the scenes is I didn't, this is using a uh, third party repo, so that's why it says 4.0. Inside our index.html file, we're loading the JavaScript API in a script tag, and everything that I just showed you, every Dojo ArcGIS API for JavaScript module that you're requesting is being transpiled into the bundle.js file. So all of the things that you're requesting, let me go back and show you. All of the things that you're requesting in TypeScript, and in this case, we're asking for just the generic interface called Esri. We're asking for Esri map, and we also have a point that we're including on here. All things that you should be familiar with in TypeScript. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, uh, this, all of this information can be found if you go to github.com slash Esri. and search for JS API resources. Just pausing because I know some people are taking pictures. Under JS API resources, in this case we're working on the 3.x API. Under the JS API resource file are all of the Esri TypeScript definitions. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that hope that the internet is uh, being kind to me. So let's go back to our TypeScript file. Oops. And you can see here we're requiring Esri, which is an interface. So if we go back to our TypeScript file, <coughs> sorry, a module. Here is our module in the Esri d.ts file. And I know this is a lot of information the good news is that you'll be able to refer later to our PowerPoint presentations or the videos, trying to show you that how all this stuff is interrelated to each other. We're making it easy because you just include the TypeScript definitions using a command line, and then you can just write your TypeScript directly. So if you, if you go to some of our repos, what you'll see in, in the README, is you're going to do something like uh, install these loaders, and, e and these loaders are either including the Esri TypeScript definitions automatically, or, or in the README of the TypeScript definition should be, should be the description of the command line that you run under Node to install these definitions. Oh, that's a lot of info. When you put it all together, it's pretty powerful. And again, this goes back to our second slide, right, Jacob, where we were saying, for those of you that, that this is new, you're starting to see this is much more different than a single page web application, which we all love, right? You throw some JavaScript on there, throw your HTML, you load in a browser, and boom, you're done. There's more moving parts here, and this is what we've referred to as modern JavaScript. Pretty cool though, right? When you, when you start putting it all together, especially if you're building a larger project with multiple developers, that's where this stuff really kicks in, where the TypeScript's going to catch things that aren't typed correctly. You're part of an automation system that's doing JS hinting and JS linting and there's a lot more controls in there to start catching errors. I don't know about you guys, I'm a terrible typer. I would love to think that I could write even three lines of code and not have a bug. So stuff like this to, to us is a huge, well even on the, the JavaScript API team, it's a huge productivity boost because we're catching these errors ahead of time rather than at production time when we're getting calls from customers. Uh, 
I know that's some pretty tiny print. Let's see if I can blow this up. Uh, again, there's examples out there. You can search for these on the web. Angular 2 Esri example is an example of uh, the exclude and require pattern. It's using an ag agnostic boilerplate called Esri Webpack TypeScript underneath. Uh, we also have some React samples out there. As Jacob said, we're, we're trying to show you that these patterns aren't just related to Angular and Webpack alone. Uh, on the React side, there's uh, Esri Webpack Babel, which as Jacob was saying, uh, also th I believe that's Renee. Odonet, O-D-O-E-N-E-T. A lot of community effort here to building all these samples that are available to you guys. And if this is the first time you've seen this stuff, I know that it takes a while to, to learn some of these patterns. So again, on pattern two, we're talking about exclude and require. Uh, the only require statements that you're going to be seeing are up at the very top of our TypeScript files where we're using a common JS pattern to include our Esri modules. So it's import something equals require and then what you see inside the require constructor is an Esri module from those TypeScript definitions. I know I'm repeating myself just a little bit but it's coming from, it's coming from our TypeScript d.ts files. Uh, now, in, in some of the examples I'm going to be showing you, we also do a little bit of mixing of ES6, also known as ES2015. Uh, you will see in some of our examples where we have a common JS pattern to import the TypeScript definition or you may also see an, an ES6 pattern which is right below this. Let me zoom in. It's a little bit small. So an ES6 pattern would be like import curly brackets something which is going to be the, the alias from Esri. The cool thing about the exclude and require pattern, one of the advantages is there's no async callbacks, there's no promises, you're just building TypeScript. You don't have to worry about all this life cycle stuff that's going on when you use pattern number one. Uh, there are some challenges as well with exclude and require. It can introduce map loading delays. Uh, you can't really quite control the lazy loading of the way you can control the, our JavaScript API using the dedicated module loader. Because remember, we're bundled inside of that main bundle. We are including all of our modules up front because the way Webpack is working in our examples here, since we're using Webpack, all of the ArcGIS API modules that we require have already been included in this bundle JS. So you could have, depending on how big your application is, when this bundle JS file loads, you can have a little bit of a delay that's going on there. Uh, there's also the global require is still there. Remember, it's just being generated behind the scenes, so there is still a global require that you have to be aware of. You can't get away from that. That's the way our ArcGIS API for JavaScript works. So, Angular 2, as an example, another community sample from Tom Wason. This is out on his repo. Uh, mainly what I wanted to do is just dive directly into his TypeScript code and just give you a very specific example. We're going to look at the map component. Should start to look similar. We have an ES6 import statement here from map service. So we know we quite, haven't quite drilled down into the final the final TypeScript file that we really want to look at. So let's go ahead and look at the, the uh, map service. And in this case, he's just using map service. This is what we're using to inject our maps. And as I warned you about ahead of time, we're mixing 
common JS statements with ES6 import statements. Some people don't like that and that's what we're using here. It works just fine. May offend some people's sensibilities depending on what, or depending on what your requirements are for this particular one. And, th and this should start look, looking familiar. There is no require statement here to bring in a web map. We're just calling the Esri ArcGIS utils module. So this should be familiar to anybody in here that's called a web map. What we do is we just return ArcGIS utils create web map. And I'm not going to go into anything else in this method. Just want to bring home that there's no require statement that you're using in the exclude and re require pattern. In this, require, in this pattern, we're using a much different approach than what Jacob showed you. Pretty cool, right? Uh, Tom's example is based on a community sample on GitHub by Lobster Optrix. So that's an, he's got some really good stuff out there from Webpack. Highly recommend you check these out. We're just reusing content that the community has built. This person does not, Lobster Optrix does not work for Esri, but we adopted his patterns and we give him credit. So we'd love to see what you guys come up with. The last section we want to talk about is going mobile. A little bit different flavor. Uh, on my personal repo, there is a sample for Ionic 2. Ionic is a highly optimized version of Angular that runs on Cordova. Now, some of you may know Cordova as PhoneGap. Cordova is the Apache open source project. PhoneGap is owned by Adobe. They're Adobe took the fork, well they take the latest fork from Cordova and make some changes to it, but they're essentially the same thing. Uh, so this Ionic 2 sample and you guys, oh I thought I opened it. This Ionic 2 sample, it's at github.com slash handygup. And essentially it's just a very simple hello world app that demonstrates the pattern that Jacob was using uh, to load the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. So inside of this tabbed application we have an HTML file and very simply, this, this should look familiar to you guys, we just have a div for where our map's going to go with just a little bit slightly different angular syntax here. We have the hash mark map on our div and I'll show you why we did that. In the TypeScript file, and this is going to be just a slight variation of what Jacob showed you. This, this variation on pattern one is optimized for mobile is we're going to go ahead and use an in ES6 import statement for the Angular 2 Esri loader. So again, I'm using a loader from the community. And what is different here is, well, I'm injecting this as a provider in my component. And where this becomes different than what Jacob showed you is for mobile applications, you don't have to, but it's recommended as a best practice, I'm pausing because I just said we weren't going to recommend any best practices. This is actually an Angular recommended best practice. You don't have to do it. This is an Esri recommending it. Uh, to implement on init, and inside the on init, we're referencing this map div directly. Now just a short note on this, especially for those of you that are familiar with Angular 2. I know that this is hardwired. This is just one way to talk directly to a div within your HTML page. Uh, using the view child, we reference the map div and we assign this property to an element ref. And I'll show you why we do that in just a second. We go ahead and inject the Esri loader service into our constructor so it makes it globally available inside our component. 
And inside on a knit, there's some other stuff here that I'll get to in just a second. We're using the pattern that Jacob showed you, which is the Esri loader. We're loading the, H, the uh, 3.x API, and everything else is the same inside the sample. What changed is how we use it inside this on and it. So a little bit different flavor in terms of how we implement it perhaps in a desktop application. Uh, the last thing I want to mention in this sample is uh, it's also showing how to use Ionic 2 with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript and geolocation. So inside this sample, we're using watch position to get a location. And every time we get a location, we're centering the map. So what this actually looks like if you run it, be something like this. This is running in a simulator on my machine, so if we were to turn this on, change our latitude, see if it's going to cooperate, put us out in the ocean there. Uh, this is a live application. Now, it, it's not going to provide all the information that you would see from if you're running it on your phone, but since I don't have a way to reflect my phone onto this uh, screen that I have here at the moment, what you would see is you'd, you'd also be getting some additional data, like satellite data. Pretty cool, right? my uh, it's weird I think I lost my reference to the presentation oops Okay, so that is uh, Ionic 2 Esri map. Uh, the last example we're going to show you is Cordova. Cordova and the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, this is Cordova by itself without Ionic. Cordova uses an init require and load pattern. So essentially this is going to be a third pattern that we're showing you. Uh, just like before, we're loading the JavaScript API and CSS varying. Uh, via script tags, you can also host these locally. Uh, we're just going to wait for the Cordova on device ready event. And the cool thing is, we're just going to use required just like normal. There's a GitHub sample out there on github.com slash Esri called Quick Start Map Phone Gap that demonstrates these patterns. But essentially, what's going on underneath the hood is we listen for device ready, and on the device ready event, we run code just like we normally would for any other single page web application. So of all the patterns that we've showed you, this is by far the easiest pattern. Uh, just a quick tour through quick start map phone gap. Uh, there's a couple of applications in here that you might be interested in. Uh, one shows how to use this pattern with GPS. Another one shows how to use a splash screen for loading. Uh, there's some 3.x samples, some 4.x samples, and there's also a sample for using this with a web map. And so with that, uh, Hopefully we've shown you there's many different ways to integrate the JavaScript API with frameworks. We didn't have enough time to really do deep dives into any one of these frameworks, but 
We hope that we gave you some ideas on how to do integration. Uh, these frameworks are changing constantly. For example, those of you that may have been using Angular 2 beta, it started out with a different module loader, right? Now it's using Webpack. These frameworks are changing constantly. We do our best to keep up with what we have, but this is where really where your input comes in and what's working and what's not working for what you guys are, are doing. And really encourage everybody to share their stuff out on GitHub. Yeah, it's uh, it, the state of the information we have to share with you for Angular 2 really wouldn't be where it is without a community effort. Um, sometimes Andy and I would see things that folks have done online and just it would totally blow us away. So there's a lot of great innovation out there. Uh, and I guess I'll just quickly remind you that the reason or, um, we have a a very specific repository that has very specific patterns and advice and suggestions for Angular 1 uh, is because we've had a few years to get to know Angular 1 and figure out sort of some best, best approaches. So again, if you're using Angular 1, I highly recommend you check out the Angular Esri map repo and all of its documentation and all of its API docs and patterns and examples. And if you're using Angular 2, then that's sort of why we took you on this journey and not in any kind of straight linear path, but sort of all over the place. Because so far we just have a few good patterns to share with you from the community, uh, but we don't have and don't really plan on making any kind of specific Esri Angular 2 repository that will just give you everything you need. Uh, at least that's the plan for right now. All right. So with that, we'll open it up. Oh, no. With that, we'll open it up for questions. Questions? Yeah. Thank you. Yep, there's a question. So I've been using um, Angular 2. I've been actually watching all those repos that you guys have been. So I thank you so much for kind of getting started on, on what I'm working on. But I've been kind of torn between making my own um, uh, components that are kind of, I guess, widgets mm -hmm. that interact with map separately and also kind of, or if I should do dojo widgets that really directly go on the map. Um, what has been your experience with like widgets? So like if I wanted to make an advanced layer manager that has more actions than just, you know, what's applied. So if, and correct me if I'm wrong, just to summarize your question so everyone else hears it, uh, it's, if you're making more advanced controls or widgets or components, do you, within your Angular 2 app, do you sort of do that within the whole uh, dojo world that lives inside of your Angular 2 app, or do you actually do it in Angular? Um, I, I, I hate to be vague, but I think you could do either one. <laughs> I think, yeah, if you're familiar with Angular 2 and you're comfortable with the HTML syntax and the bindings that you have and the, and the reactive forms, then go for it, yeah. But if you feel like you, someone, either whether it's an Esri out of the box widget or you've already done your own development in Dojo uh, for some complicated widget that does all these cool things, then maybe there's a really good reason why you just want to put it inside, um, put inside the whole little, little Dojo world inside of Angular. Esri uh, for, Great. Yeah, it's, it's great. Research. Yeah, so I think KGS yeah. nine one six or yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think his name is Keith. Uh, he, uh, yeah. If I'm sure, I'm I'm not sure if he's here today, but I'm sure he'd be really happy to have pull requests and more <laughs> more widgets if you build them. Yeah. So there's another question. Question was, can we wrap the REST API in another I that another API that's not Dojo based? Yeah. Are you make it a straight Angular API or or better yet, just make it straight JavaScript with no framework. Are, are you sort of uh, getting at like the actual requests that get sent out and like the wrappers around those uh, yeah. network I mean, requests? Right, right now you took Dojo and you wrapped your REST API. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So now you've got an entire framework around the rest of the which now we're getting so many frameworks flying at us from all different directions <laughs> that picking one, you can't win. You can't pick one framework and win in the job of the world right now. Um, somebody thought we could say, well, how come you don't have this sort of framework? So isn't there a way you guys could just So if I, yeah, I think I follow what you're saying. So I mean, uh, just to clarify, so with the Esri JavaScript API that does rely, of course, on Dojo's built on it, it maybe, uh, like it has the built-in identify task or uh, feature layer query, and that, that does use Dojo requests to go talk to the REST API. But the REST API in and of itself, uh, one could write the Angular HTTP requests themselves, and just talk directly to the REST to the REST endpoints. But sure, we just don't have we don't have yeah. any plans to do that. Yeah, yeah. If that was the question, we don't have any plans to rewrite the REST API <laughs> and re and replace the JavaScript API with another API. Sure, we could. It would be great if someone in the community would take this on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, whether it's you or someone else, I. Uh, Yeah, and one of the reasons why we're not going to do it is there's a lot more to the JavaScript API than just making REST requests. I mean, there's a there's a huge visualization component. There's all the 3D stuff, and those those are just small examples of the kind of stuff that's in there. And to to go ahead and you know what you see when you see a map or even a 3D map is really just the tip of the iceberg and the other 95% of the API is doing a ton of heavy lifting for analysis and display and management of the data that, that the REST API by itself just doesn't do. So to give you a specific example would be like the uh, a REST request to grab a single tile. So you'd have to rewrite some sort of tile manager to display maps and handle. And it's not just that. There's panning and zooming, there's gesture managers in there for mobile and all sorts of other stuff. So, I definitely feel your pain, totally understand, completely agree, but there's no plans to do that on our side. Uh, other questions? Well, we'll be up here for a few more minutes. Thanks everybody for attending. Yeah. Thank you.